We have just finished Nintendo Power's fifth year, and it means it's time once again for the best of the rest, where we cover those titles that made the Nintendo Power Top 20, in this case, but were not featured in the magazine itself. We only have one NES game this time, as all the remaining NES titles were games that were featured in the magazine. This can be attributed either to the NES approaching the end of its life, or the fact that the Top 30 has contracted to 20, and the majority of movements in the rankings happen at the bottom of that 30, particularly once the heavy hitters like Mario, Zelda, Castlevania, and Final Fantasy came out. The thing, conceptually, that worked about the original Home Alone games was that the developers tried, with varying degrees of success, to build a game around the concept of going through houses, setting traps for the burglars, and getting the owner's valuables into a safe place before the wet bandits could get them. It didn't entirely work, but the concept was there. You set you traps and obstacles in, the, in front of the burglars to slow their movements and buy you more time so you can explore and find the things you need and get them to safe locations. Here, the game dumps the entire whole for focus of the series. Not just like the last game, but the kind of fundamental premise of the series that makes it work. Setting traps and stopping the wet bandits. And instead, we get evasion levels based around getting a out of the various hotels and other buildings where Kevin tries to stay. Further, the controls are still pretty crappy, and the learning curve when it comes to level design is less a curve and more a kind of unforgiving cliff. For the Super Nintendo, we have four titles. The Super Nintendo version of Home Alone 2, two sports games, and a, and a simulator. Home Alone 2 for the Super Nintendo plays pretty much exactly like the NES game, except with a designated interact button for elevators and multiple background layers. Well, foreground and background layers. It's still very bad, it's still very clunky, and still had the almost exact same level designs, and it's still not worth your time. Next is Super Battle Tank. And with Super Battle Tank, it's important to remember that this game is designed to be a serious simulator. So the question is, how well does it control as a simulator, and is it a fun simulator to play? So, this game is slow. Not in terms of the tank moving slowly. You'll, you'll go over hundreds of miles at a fair clip. I mean, the first mission can have up to six minutes without contact with an enemy, possibly longer, depending on how fast you go. Um, now, when you do make contact and throw down, it can be a really intense fight, but I didn't have any too many problems with the controls. Sort of. I can scroll the camera on screen, and the game does map turning your tank to the shoulder buttons and turning your guns with the D-pad, which is the right way to do it, and something I criticized Mech Warrior for not doing. But I can't turn my turret at a 90-degree angle to the tank's direction of movement, which is kind of what makes the difference between a tank and self-propelled artillery. Still, it's a playable and potentially fun game, but it's also a game that I'd probably describe as more of a podcast game than anything else. Next we have NHL Players Association Hockey 93. This is a well-done, well-animated hockey game. I really got a sense of momentum on the ice that I didn't really feel with some of the NES hockey games I've played. The controls are also generally very simple, and it handles some of the physical dynamics of hockey really well. For example, if you pass to a player's back, if the puck can't get to that player's stick, the pass will fail, as opposed to some of the NES titles, where you pass more or less directly to your target and stick position doesn't matter. Also, the amount of scoring in the game felt right for a hockey game. It's, you didn't have big blowouts or anything like that. Hockey's a low-scoring game. It's a very fast-paced, quick-moving low-scoring game, but it's a low-scoring game nonetheless. All in all, NHLPA Hockey... 93 definitely helps continue to establish EA's reputation as one of the best developers of sports video games. <clears throat> and speaking of EA, we have Bulls vs. Blazers after this, 
And this is the first console basketball game that I have played for the show that really feels enjoyable. And I feel like I can do well at this game, and after an early dry spell, I got the hang of the controls, and at least the arcade difficult setting, and was able to consistently land shots and feel that when I did well in the game, it was because I was doing well in the game. Not because the random number generator was having me do well. And similarly, when I did poorly, and I was, with a little time to understand what I was doing wrong, I was able to improve, or try to do what I needed to do to improve. But other basketball games, I didn't quite get that. For the Game Boy, we have only one title, the Game Boy version of Home Alone 2. Link's Awakening also showed up on the list, but I'm holding off on that until issue number 50, where it's the cover game. And we leave off on Home Alone 2 for the Game Boy. And it plays just like it did on everything else. An unpleasant, floaty sort of game with a sort of nonsensical level of design and enemies that, frankly, makes the game feel like it was born as a licensed platformer for the ZX Spectrum. You know, what I like about the licensed Alien 3 games is that each version of the game was tweaked to fit the strengths of the platform. The NES and Game Boy versions are all about the run. Learning the level find, and finding the optimal route to your goal, and in the case of the NES version, having to hit a series of goal posts in terms of prisoners along the way. The 16-bit versions, on the other hand, play like a non-linear Metroidvania-esque thing. However, as far as the Nintendo versions of Home Alone 2 are concerned, they're all designed exactly the same, they all have almost identical level designs, and they only make minor or minor graphical or control-based adjustments based on the platform. I am extremely disappointed by the developers, Imagineering, for their sheer lack of imagination that they have displayed with these games. My pick for this episode is Bulls vs. Blazers, probably the best basketball game I've played thus far, and definitely one which I'm glad to have in my library. And no, it's not just because my Portland Trail Blazers are also featured in the title. Well, not my, I don't own the Portland Trail Blazers, but you know what I mean. Anyway, next time we start Nintendo Power's sixth year, which will feature another version of Street Fighter II, the return of Samus Aran with Super Metroid, and the first appearance of Street Fighter's biggest competition, albeit in a watered-down form. So, look forward to that. Three. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.